Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Musr Mondays. And we're coming to you live from the Torch Center, where we meet every Monday night together with an incredible group of people here uh, and study our character traits to learn how to become the greatest people we can become. So, tonight's topic is going to be tzniyut, which is modesty. It's not the modesty that most of us may associate with. Most of us, when we hear the word modesty, we think, "Uh uh-oh, the rabbi's going to start telling us what clothes to wear. Absolutely not. That's not what we're talking about. We're going to talk about modesty of character. But before we start talking about that and hear what you think modesty is, we're going to make sure that everyone has a meter worksheet. Now, as you know, the meter worksheet is, is important because if you don't have a worksheet, do you have one? Yes, I do. Do you have one? You got a pen? So the meter worksheet is very important because uh, we're, it's going to be, it's your own private sheet, but it'll give you the opportunity not only to take notes, but to define the trait. You see, many of us, as we've seen through the past almost 20 weeks where we've done different traits, learned through different traits, we came in thinking that the trait meant something. We talk about kindness. We, talk about, we thought it was one thing. And then when we finally were done, we saw it was totally not what we thought it was originally. So we're going to have to, at the end of class, we'll give a few minutes for everyone to write down their new definition that we've learned through class of what this trait is. Then we're going to have step number two is introspection. We're going to be able to evaluate where we are holding in this trait right now. Where am I? Am I a one? Am I a ten? Am I, um, you know, or am I a six and a half? And I need a lot of improvement. Or even if I'm a ten, I need strengthening to ensure that I stay a ten with this trait in perfection. Then we have a practical work, which is step number three, which is how do I be, how do I accomplish my goal? If I want to become perfect in this trait, what steps do I need to take to get there? What can I institute immediately? And then the fourth is accepting something on myself. Because if we don't accept something that I'm going to once a day, twice a day, for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes, for an hour, work on this trait, then we'll never actually, if we don't set aside time now, when we're inspired to actually do it, it's going to be very difficult for us to dedicate time randomly uh, towards this trait. So any of our friends out there, if you don't have this form, the meet a worksheet, uh, at home, you're welcome to email me at awalby at torchweb.org, and I will happily send it to you. You can also send it to Muster Mondays at torchweb.org, and I will happily send it to you. You'll have your own PDF. You can print it out every week and when you're listening uh, to the Facebook Live or YouTube uh, presentations of this class online. Okay, let's begin. Sniut. Okay, so we see in Micha, it says the following, man will tell you what is good and what Hashem demands of you. Just to do judgment, loving kindness, and be modest going in His ways. Right? lechet im Hashem elokecha. To go with modesty, the ways of Hashem. Okay, and you know, when you think of modesty, what do you think about? When you think of modesty, what do you think about? (coughs) Uncle Don. Uh, Dressing appropriately. Dressing appropriately. Pretty much dressing appropriately. Dressing appropriately. Yeah, dressing appropriately and thinking appropriately. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. I think the dressing, not so much dressing appropriate, but dressing how you would think God wants you to go. Okay. Bobby? Pretty much the same as everybody else, and I also think it includes things like language and uh, how you act with other people uh, in, a, in a way acceptable. Excellent. Casile? Okay. I think it would be more like knowing and believing that. Okay. Behaving so you don't stand out in crowds. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Resisting the tendency for self-aggrandizement. Okay, I like that. I like them all. What do you say, Shlomo? 
Huh? No, no idea. Okay, Camden. I, I'm still with the dressing. You're still with the dressing. Okay, so we're gonna right off the bat, we're gonna say that we're gonna try to stay away from the dress code. Good. Okay. Good. So for those of you watching online, you have no nothing to worry about. We're not trying to tell you what to wear and how to dress in public or in private. That's not that's not what the really this class is gonna be. We're gonna talk about something which is really more fundamental than what we actually wear. But it's the way in which we act, the way in which we talk, the way in which we walk, the way in which we think. Okay? So that's really what we're going to try to do. Okay. So we, we, we're going to work with, with one idea. We, you know, we spoke about this when we spoke about humility. Now, what is humility? Humility means, or what is arrogance? So we're going to get to talking about arrogance. We haven't done it yet. But when we talk about arrogance, what is arrogance? Arrogance is someone who wants to make sure everybody knows who they are. What's someone who's humble? Someone who gives other people space to exist. Right? You see that there are people who are humble. It's pleasant to be next to them. We know about the Aron. The Aron was the, was the ark that was in the tabernacle. It's a very incredible thing. The Aron, the ark, represented humility. Why did it represent humility? It's so very interesting. The size of the room was 20 amot, size of the room that it was in. And if you went, it itself was 2 amot. So how much room would be left on each side? 18? Well, 16? Well, right, so there would be 9 on each side, right? But if you measured it, it was actually 10 on each side. How did that happen? It itself took 2. You measured it, it was 2. You measured the sides, and it was 10. How is that possible? If you measured the whole distance, it was 20. Something is wrong. Something is off. Sages tell us because the Aron, the Ark, represented the entire Jewish people. It represented humility. The humil when someone is humble, there's room for everybody else. I don't take any place. Okay? That's when we talk about humility and we talk about arrogance. When we talk about modesty, modesty is something totally different. Modesty is not standing out. Modesty means not to stand out. Okay? We know people who they want to make sure everybody sees when they walk into the room, everybody sees their pink bow tie. Right? Or their flashy shoes. They want to make sure that's not modesty. It doesn't mean that they're arrogant. It doesn't mean that they're showy. But that's not modesty. Modesty means that not everyone needs to pay attention. Not everyone needs to notice them when they're walking in. They don't have to make a splash wherever they go. So don't be in center stage. Don't try to be the center of attention. Right? It's not calling attention to yourself. Now, there are many people uh, who have a custom not to wear certain clothes that draw too much attention. Right? It's, it's a nice, that's the idea of modesty. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to look disheveled. It doesn't mean that they're not dressed fashionable but they're dressed in a way that it doesn't draw attention. Okay? Extra attention. We see, this, week's, this week we're going to have the Fast of Esther on Thursday, and then we have Purim observed on Sunday. What, what time is on this? So we'll, we'll, we'll get to it right after class. We'll give, I'll give it away. Right? But what we have on Sunday, we have the actual observance of Purim. And we ask the question, what, what was the big miracle of Purim? Esther saved us. Well, who really saved us? The Almighty saved us. The Almighty saved us from the hand of the wicked, wicked Achashverosh and Haman, who, who had already decreed, signed the order, that the Jewish people would be annihilated on the 13th day of Adar. And it was turned around. Why? Our sages tell us. Why was Esther the one who merited that such a great degree would be turned around? In her merit... What was her merit? Modesty. Her med merit was modesty. Uh, her modesty brought about this, this incredible uh, miracle. Perform the mitzvahs, it says, to perform the mitzvahs in secret. Okay? Right? We see that escorting the dead. Right? So the Hevra Kadisha, anybody who's part of the burial society, which is an incredible mitzvah to be involved with, and I encourage all of you, if you can, to be involved, to volunteer with the burial society, right? It's, it, 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 
Obviously, it doesn't cost you any money, but most people don't, don't charge for it. They just do it out of the goodness of their heart. And most people won't tell anyone that they're actually part of this society. It's modest. Nobody needs to know. We do it. And you know what? You know who doesn't thank them? Nobody. They don't want anybody's thanks. The deceased, okay, once you finish cleaning them and washing them and clothing them with their shrouds, they don't sit up and say, guys, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. You know, and they lay back right in the coffin. That doesn't happen, right? You get thanks from nobody. But that's the beauty, is that the people who are involved don't want recognition. They don't want anybody to know. It's a modest group. They're doing it just like God did it. Right? If the seventh day of Adar, which is... What's, what, what's today? Is today the seventh? Today's the eighth day of Adar. So yesterday was the seventh day of Adar, which was the, the yard site, right? The, the day that Moses was born and passed away on. The same day. And which is, by the way, very interestingly, what Haman chose. Haman went through all the months and he found that there was a merit for the Jews on every month. So he wasn't able to destroy the Jewish people on any month until he got to the month of Adar. He said, hey, the Jewish leader, Moses, died on this month. But what he didn't realize is that he was also born this month. So while you can hold it against the Jewish people as it's not a merit, it also is a merit because he was born also on this month. And our, our redemption came through Moses and also the there are many other, other reasons that the Midrash brings as to the merits that, that were in this month, that are in this month. Okay, but either way, escorting the dead is something we do privately. Marrying off the bride. To do these deeds humbly. I want to tell you an incredible story. My great uncle of blessed memory, was, his name was Rabbi Chaim Kreisworth. Rabbi Chaim Kreisworth was the chief rabbi of... Uh, of um, of uh, uh, was Antwerp. Okay, he was the chief rabbi of Antwerp. An incredible man, a man who knew all of Torah inside out. When he was young, er, when he was younger, he passed away in his, deep in his, in his 90s, but when he was younger, he got very ill. And he went to a rabbi for a blessing. So the rabbi said, pass me a sitter, please, uh, any of them. The, the rabbi said to him, he says, you know, in the morning prayer, Right after we make the blessing for the for the the to learn Torah to study Torah, thank you so much. So we say a Mishnah, and the Mishnah we say we, we recite is the Mishnah from Peah. It says the following: Elu Devarim. These are the precepts whose fruit a person enjoys in this world, but whose principle remains intact for him in the world to come. And it goes through the honor due to father and mother, the acts of kindness, early attendance to the house of study in the morning, and the evening, hospitality to guests, visiting the sick. So listen to this, okay? Tell me if this makes sense to you. Visiting the sick, providing for a bride, and escorting the dead. These are all mitzvahs that you get double reward. Reward here and reward in the world to come. Does that order make sense? Again, here's the order. Visiting the sick... Escorting, uh, sorry, visiting the sick, providing for a bride, and escorting the dead. Shouldn't providing for the bride come before visiting the sick? Because usually it goes from sickness to death. Right? Someone gets sick and then they die. And instead we see, you know, visiting the sick, providing for a bride, and then escorting the dead. It's a little out of order. So the rabbi said... The rabbi said, you know why it's like that? He said, I'll tell you. Because if a person has sickness, and he wants to ensure that he doesn't end up coming to a point of death, be involved in providing for the bride. Help orphans. Help young ladies who need to get married. Help them get married. He says, if you dedicate your life to helping the bride, to providing for the bride... It's going to distance the illness from the death. Sir so Rabbi Kreisworth dedicated his life to raising money for, for, the, for, 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 the, for the orphans, but also for just a bride 
who comes from a poor family. She doesn't have a way to pay for a wedding. She doesn't have a way to have it to, to, to you know to rent a gown and you know for flowers, whatever was necessary for a wedding. The rabbi raised the money. And thousands of brides he married off. And he lived to a very, very old age, right, in this merit. Could you explain? I still don't understand what you're saying. That what? What you just said. Meaning, here's illness, then providing for the bride, and then death. Shouldn't the illness be next to the death? Why do you have the bride in the middle? It's to tell you that if someone who cares to marry you off a bride, distances the illness from the death. Okay? But you know what else is amazing? He was very modest about it. Not, not everyone needs to know. Not everyone needs to know all of the mitzvahs that you do. Right? I will say in my own story of how I was a little bit humbled. Uh, I had a rabbi who came to visit in town, Rabbi Nutter Greenblatt. Everyone familiar with Rabbi Nutter Greenblatt is one of the most prominent rabbis today in the United States. He lives in Memphis, Tennessee. And he is one of the most uh, uh, greatest experts when it comes to a get, to writing a get. There are very specific laws. It's not such a simple thing. And he flies around the country, and he, and he you know, does that service for people and provides the proper get the way it should be. Either way, so he was coming to Houston to, to, to do a couple of gets, and I was assigned to go pick him up from the airport. So... I was, it was after the Tuesday night class. He was arriving at 9 o'clock, and the class used to be from 8 to 9. And it was like, how am I going get to get, get to the airport on time? So as soon as 9 o'clock was out, I dashed out the door, ran to the airport, and I come to the airport. And as I pull up to the airport, I see him at the front door looking at his watch. And I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm 15 minutes late, right? So I assumed that he was waiting for me for 15 minutes. So sure enough... As soon as I, I, I got there, I put my car in park. I ran out and I tell the rabbi, I said, Rabbi, I'm here. Shalom, right? Shalom Aleichem. Come to the car. I open the door for him. And as, as I get back in the car, I said, I'm so sorry. I just finished my class. I ran over here as quickly as I could. I didn't know that he had just gotten out. And he just got out. So he looks over to me. He's an older man. He's, I think, well in his 80s. He's got a sense of humor. He's sharp. He's inc- just an incredible man. So he looks to me. He says, you're a grandson of Rabbi Wolby. You can accept my musa. You can accept my, uh, my, uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, how do you call it, my constructive criticism. But he says to me, nobody cares how big of a tzaddik you are. Nobody cares how big of a righteous man you are. Nobody needs to know about all the classes you're teaching. <laughs> right? So... You came, you came. Nobody needs to know about it. And he's 100% right. The thing is, I realized, one second, maybe, maybe there's something in there. But I just want you to know that I'm not just late. I mean, just, nobody needs to know all of the righteous things that you're doing. Okay? And it's a, it's a great lesson. It's a great lesson. Some things are best left untold. Not everyone needs to know everything. Yes? Okay, so this is something that's been on my mind for a long time, for years. So why is it that every synagogue, every facility has to have everybody's name on it who uh-huh. gave money? Mm-hmm. I see that as not being very modest. I think it's very generous. I think maybe it's the type of thing also anonymity is a terrific way to support a facility, but not one Jewish place in any city. In it. And I, I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm not mm-hmm. passing judgment. I'm just saying mm-hmm. if modesty is such a part of what we're learning, this to me doesn't make sense. You're a hundred percent right. The problem okay. is, is that, like to see their name okay, there. how many Jews are there in Houston? We say about 60,000 Jews in Houston. They're not all at this class, right? right? So many of them don't feel that same way, probably because they just have never learned about this. And they don't understand what modesty necessarily is. You know, people love to see their names. People love to hear their names. And they love when people talk about their names. And they're like, look at that. You know who donated that? And you know who donated that? And people, right? Now, there are people who are modest and don't want their names, but they put it anyway. Right? So that it encourages other people to give. That's something else. But a person really has to know what's really going on inside. Is it an excuse? 
right? Or is it the real reason? Well, it's been fundraising. It's a way to get other people. Other people. Well, the, the, the Schwartzes are doing this and the Shapiros are Correct. doing this, you know, whatever. But that's always really... I don't like to say it's bothering me because it's not a judgment. I, I'm so, delighted that people are so generous. Right. You know, and it is a beautiful thing. And yeah. sometimes they do it in memory of someone. Yeah. So they so they want the memory to be there. They don't want their name necessarily associated with it. But they did it in honor of a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent. And they want it to be a merit to them. So let's not be judgmental about people who don't have it. For ourselves, we know, and I'll share with you a few stories. If you look over there on that shelf, it's donated by Anonymous. Yes, I saw that. And there's another one coming here, Musser uh, 1, which is also going to be donated by Anonymous. It was generously uh, donated by someone this week. And he said, I don't want anyone to know who it is. Don't even put my initials. Right? That's a special thing. Not everyone's at, at, at that level. So it's a, it's a really beautiful thing. Now, it doesn't mean, God forbid, that if someone does have their name, that they're arrogant or this and that. That's not what we're saying. We're saying some people, they have an extra sensitivity that they want their name not to be shown. Okay? Now, they also have to know, is it also not going to be shown? Do they not want it shown because they don't want other organizations to come over to them? Is it, so you have to really know what's the reason behind it, which is what we're doing this exercise for. We're doing this exercise so we can get down to the bottom of where we are individually, privately, so we can mark ourselves on this sheet, on this meter worksheet, where am I really with modesty? Am I only modest so that other people should think I'm modest? <clears throat> but really, I really don't. You know, like, I'll sneak it in there, and they're like, ooh, they weren't supposed to announce that, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, you had a question. Okay, a couple, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think it's nice that people put their names on because it didn't come from you know, from, from trees. True. It, it came from a, a specific person that, that donated. And, 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 and people shouldn't take for granted that, you know, the things that we have just, you know, appear miraculous. You know, miraculous. I, I agree. The other thing is, Maimonides had those eight levels of... Of giving. And Anonymous wasn't the... Wasn't the... Uh, it That's, is one of them. Well, I know, but it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, I think it was like it was in seventh place, right. not in eighth place, right? Right. What, what was in eighth place? What was... What I, was I, don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but we, we should have it over here. Maybe I'll, I'll have it printed. The okay, eighth, eighth. I, I, I do remember that. You right. Know, there are all, all different ways of charitable giving, mm -hmm. and, and anonymous was like in second place. Correct. Is it, is it not the anonymous... Giving, giving to someone anonymously who gives it right. anonymously that, to someone. That's correct. That's one of them, but that, I don't think that that's the highest. Either way, yes. So, you never watch this show, so, but I, we were, my wife and I watched Curb Your Enthusiasm, and there were, Larry David gave a million dollars for a um, wing at the hospital, and they called it the Larry David Wing, mm -hmm. and then Ted Danson gave a million dollars for his wing, but he's called anonymous. So everybody's standing up and clapping for the anonymous gift, which they knew was Ted Danson. And Larry David who gave the same amount. They didn't say one thing about it. Well, that's exactly what well, but again, there are people, you can go to the museums and you can see all the people who are giving anonymously right. not, right? They, they're buying their name on a wall. That's right. They want to be, you know, okay. Either way, let's, we're, not, we're not here to judge people. We're grateful that people are able to be so generous with their money. But what we're trying to do is for ourselves here, for those of us here in this room and those of us online, we're trying to incorporate a little bit more of a modesty that not everything needs to be known to everyone you know, out there. Okay? So uh, are we correlating anonymity with modesty? Sometimes. Not always. Again, it has to be for the right reason. Right? Because sometimes anonymity uh, is only going to call more attention. Right? Because everyone's going to be like, oh, who's that one? Yeah. Right? right? That's not, that's not modest either. So we have to be Plus, careful about that. If you're on the bank, you want to be anonymous too. Right. Right, but I've got to tell something that's really funny. Really okay, hilarious. sure. So just to be considerate, to speak up so the people this, online this, can this, hear. This really did happen. I was at the Richmond Library years ago, and I was so excited about this book. Name of the author was Anon. 
So I went to the A's and I you know, went to AM. I didn't see any anon. And it was a it was abbreviation for anonymous. Right. And that was who wrote the book, but I was so excited I went I thought somebody was named a anon. Right. Or or uh, it's an Israeli it can be an Israeli name, you never know. What's the first right? one? You couldn't find it. You couldn't oh, find it. So yeah. oh, I'm just so stupid not to know it was anonymous. <laughs> All right. So of course, things that we do in public should be with modesty. Okay. Anything that we do in public should be things which we things should be private. Th sorry. Mm -hmm. Things that we do in public should be modest. Things that we do that should be private should, of course, remain private. It's, you know, the idea is that when, we, when we're talking about modesty, you, spoke, you mentioned earlier about speech, modest speech. The way in which we talk, the way in which we talk should also be modest, right? The things, there are certain things that shouldn't be spoken about, right? So people shouldn't, shouldn't joke about those things, and people shouldn't laugh about those things. There are certain things that also requires a certain element of... It's, a, it's the subject, not the manner in which one speaks. It's the subject that one talks about. And it's also the manner in which one speaks. It's all of them together. Okay? Again, it's not about it getting a recognition. It's about not calling attention to yourself. Okay? Undue attention. Unnecessary attention. Okay. According to some of the commentaries, it's not to get fame. We're not looking to get fame. Uh, do it because it's right, not for the aggrandizement. Okay? It's, we say the word Hatsne Lechet. <coughs> Hatsne comes from the word Tzniyut, means modesty. Okay? We say Hatsne is a term of Tzniyut. All right? And also from Nistar. Nistar means hidden. Esther is the same word as Nistar, hidden. The whole miracle of the book of Esther is that God brought about the miracles in a hidden way. God operates in a hidden fashion. Right? Just like you don't see God show up right here in front of you, right? It's, it's hidden. It's behind. You don't, not, not everything needs to be shown. You know, it's, it's an incredible thing that you, if you ever look at, at uh, the Queen, the Queen of England, right? The Queen of England, you ever see the Queen of England eating ice cream? Nobody. We have accumulatively... In our, all of the people here in this room, about a thousand, uh, yeah, almost probably 800 years accumulatively between all of us, co co sorry, collectively, right? And in those 800 years, we've all been, uh, you know, uh, reading through the media, and we've all been, uh, you, uh, you know, hearing, uh, hearing news and watching news and seeing uh, newspapers and we've never seen one picture of the Queen of England with, a, with, with any food in her hand. Ever. Right? You know why? Because that's one thing that she understands. The more dignified something is, the less public it is. Right? <coughs> she understands the dignity of being a queen. And therefore, you'll never see her eating an ice cream cone in public. Right? It's just not, it's not royalty. It's not the way in which you, you, uh, someone who's of royalty carries themselves. We are royalty. Each one of us are royalty. And that's not either the way we carry ourselves. And we see this incredible thing with Esther. Right? Esther was modest. The miracle came through a modest way. It came in not direct. Nobody knew it was coming. It was all behind the, behind the scenes. Okay? So the term Tzniyut and, and, and Hester. I want to share with you a story. I hope my father, may he live and be well, uh, and he should be healthy and happy for many, many years. Uh, this is a true story, and I know he might get upset that I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. So my father was once approached by someone uh, who used to pay, stay by my parents' house uh, whenever he'd come to the United States from Israel to collect for his, uh, his uh, girls' seminary. Uh, that he had in, in, in Israel. And he would, he would raise money for this. I think it was a bunch of orphans uh, that he was, that he was uh, primarily focused on. And uh, he used to stay by my parents. And uh, he, he knew my parents were of uh, modest means. 
and weren't able to really contribute that much. They'd give him something, but it wasn't like an, a, 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 a sizable uh, gift. Uh, one year, when this person stayed by my parents, my father gave him a considerable contribution. What for my father was outrageous. So, my father made a condition to, with him and that he doesn't tell anyone about it. I only found out about this 25 years later. Okay, I'll tell you what happened. Okay, we were, I was a guest at someone's house, and this man was there. I, I remember seeing this man once or twice, but I didn't know. So he asks me, what's your name? I tell him my name. He says, oh, that's your father? So-and-so? I said, yes. So he says, I have to tell you a story. He says, I, w- I used to come every year to collect, and I would stay by your parents, and they'd give you, you know, $100 or something. One year, your father gave me a very big gift, and I asked him, you know, y- your father said, don't think that I'm going to have this every year. I never have this, but this year I have it, and I'm going to give it to you. He says, why are you giving it to me? So this is what my father answered. Again, my father is going to be upset that I'm saying this, but I'm asking forgiveness in advance. He said... Because your girl school for Israeli orphans, right, my family's here in the United States, is something that, God willing, I will never, ever need. It's, I'll never need to come onto your school. And I want to give to an institution that cannot give anything back to me. He said, I, the reason why I'm giving this money is because I, I had a deal and I promise that if the deal comes through, I'm going to give charity to the first person I find who I can give charity to. And you, the deal just closed, and therefore I, you, you were staying at my house, and I'm going to give it to you, but I also wanted it to be to an institution that I can never get anything back from. Because if I give it to my synagogue, oh, they're going to honor me. I'm going to give it to my kid's school. They're going to give preferential treatment. They're going to do it. I want to give it to an institution I cannot get any benefit back from. And I'm begging you, I don't want anyone to know about this. So this was on Shabbos when I heard the story. And after Shabbos, I called my father, and I'm like, wow. I said, is this true? He says, who told it to you? (laughs) So I told him, this rabbi was here in Houston, and he told it to me. So, but, but the idea is, the idea is, is that, to do something for really, in 25 years, nobody knew about the story. I think the, the, you know, the rabbi told me, he says, I, I think your father told me not to say anything, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway, because it's 25 years ago, the, you know, the statute of limitations are over, right? But a private world, a private world, meaning a modest world, means that there is an internal world. We all have this external world that everybody is able to see. But is there an internal world? A world within. That's what we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have an internal world, a world that's inside, that's, that's enriched. There's so much more to than just the outside world being, you know, someone insults you, oh, yeah, I'm so insulted. If you have an internal world, right, you don't get so insulted. You know, okay, so, so they said they had a, real, a rough day, right? Okay. There's another point of not raising eyebrows. Not having people look, oh, what's going on with them? They got a new car, right? So it's also important with regarding to, to people who are uh, entrusted either by organizations or synagogues or, or, or companies uh, to be responsible for, for money, not to do anything that's going to cause people to be suspicious. Right? If the, if, the, if the rabbi of the synagogue suddenly starts driving a Bentley, everyone's like, oh, really? That's what we pay him for, right? He's, he's driving a Ferrari. There's something, something wrong. It just doesn't fit, right? There is a way to live life without calling that attention to ourselves. Right? It says regarding a, a, a gabai. A gabai is the person who collects the charity in the synagogue, someone who goes and collects 
for the synagogue, right? So they go with the cup and they go around, right? Then they ask everybody for, you know, for they go around. So that person is not supposed to change that money in his own pocket. He's not supposed to carry the money in his own pocket. Why? So people shouldn't come to say he's swapping his own money with it and he's mixing everything in. And, what, you, you don't trust him? No, it's not an issue of trust. Don't raise suspicion about yourself. Don't call attention to yourself. There are enough problems in the world without us raising eyebrows of other people. Right? It's important to remember this idea, this principle is don't, don't, uh, don't raise eyebrows okay, of suspicion. Privacy is not about being hidden, but rather about having a self-dignity and a self-worth. Not needing outside elements to validate us. Right? What happens is many people like to show so that everybody says something. But someone who has an internal world doesn't need everybody to say something. And the more we're able to build that internal world, the less we need the outside. Okay? So, today, people don't have self-dignity, so everyone is public and on display. People are all on display 24 hours a day. Because everything's about what people are going to say. What are people going to think? I don't know. I can't do this. I can't do that. Because what, 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 what's this person going to say? What's that person going to say? I think I've shared this story recently, but I'll just say it. I heard it uh, many years ago from Rabbi Amnon Yitzchak. He said a, a very, very funny story. He said there was once a, a, uh, there was once a, a young Yemenite couple. They just left their wedding, uh, their own wedding. And someone gave them a gift, a very generous gift. They gave them a donkey. Right? A donkey. Oh! Great, now they have a, it's like someone giving them a car, right? But now they have a way to get home. So the groom gets on the donkey, and his wife is walking next to him. So a group of people pass by, and they're like, on the day of your wedding, that's the way you treat her, right? You make her walk like that. He says, you know, you're right. He gets off the donkey, puts her on. Puts her on the donkey, he walks. Past another group of people, like, on, on the day of the wedding, she's already controlling you, right? That's what you let her, right? So he says, you know what? You're right. So they both get, they're both on the donkey. They pass another group of people. They're like, poor donkey. What did he do wrong? You're both on top of him, right? So they said, you know what? You're right. So they put the donkey on their back. And then people, there's another group of people pass. They're like, look, three donkeys, right? So... If you were going to follow whatever people say and whatever people, you know, whatever people think, that's what we, that's what we end up being like. Right? We have to do what we know is the right thing to do. Oh, they do it. Oh, it has to be great. They did it also. Oh, this must be the right thing. The problem is that that's the reality. If you think of marketing, what marketing companies do, you know, hush puppies. You know how hush puppies became hush puppies? They took the biggest socialites in New York City, and they brought them, they called them into a, into a special meeting, and they gave them that, those shoes. And they paid them to wear those shoes for a little bit amount of time. And suddenly, everybody wanted to wear those shoes. Because, hell, that's what they're... What happened to a person's independence, to a person's own thoughts, to a person's own likings? The person, it, we don't have to like what everybody else likes. You know, it's like, I say that really, the whole iPhone craze, that people wait you know, six blocks, right, to get that iPhone. This is for you, right? The same thing with the Google phone. Right? So, right? Or, or exactly, like you're saying, the, the shoes, the new LeBrons come out. The new shoes come out, and people are waiting down the block and around the corner just so that they can get the... What, what's the whole craze? Really, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a mishagas. It's, it's really... But everybody has it. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody. So people don't, don't have their own independent identity. Their identity is dependent on everybody else's acknowledgement. And that's a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous place for us to be beholden to what everybody else thinks. You know, we have to build our own identity. Yes? So we know, Rabbi, too, it's just you can't please all people. So it's just, it's ridiculous to try to do that. Hey, but look, it's, look, look, one second. Well, well, let's take a second. Let's look at Hollywood. Or, or pick anybody in Los Angeles, right? They look like lunatics, most of them, right? Yeah. Why? Because everybody wants to stand out. 
Everybody wants to be unique. The story that you just told about the, the couple with the donkey is right. a perfect example. Because no matter what you do, somebody or how you behave, or someone's going to somebody's got something to oh, say oh, about so, it. And that's, so you just you just think do about, what do, what's do right the right thing and, is, and, and that's it, it, and not care about and it. I think it's really important. Yeah. So, but here's a very important thing, right? If we have young children, right? Our job, even not young children, even older children, we have to build them up. So that they don't need, see, the more they know that we see the positive of them, that we see how great they are, how unique and special they are, the less they need to do crazy, stupid things to get that attention. So there's a healthy way for a person to be built. I'm talking now as a parent, we need to instill this in the way we raise our children. Yes? And narcissism. How, there's a correlation here that we're talking about because the, today it seems there are so many narcissistic people that could benefit from hearing this type of. A, I mean, all of us need to know and to be sort of reconnected to the root of the, the issue and. And I think of Hollywood or things like that. If you watch late night TV, and there's this young man named Waters is his last name, and he'll ask people questions on the street. You know, like no, I'm familiar. It, 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 it's so embarrassing to me to think that people can be so out of touch and so into their different. That, but I'm getting off track. But that's but this the word narcissistic people. You know, when I was coming up, when I was a young woman, you never heard those terms because it wasn't so popularized. Right, and right, right. But I, I think overall, every person wants to feel unique. Every single human being, that's our, ver- that's our uh, the need of every human being is to, is to feel unique. We all want to feel unique, right? But there's a normal, healthy way to feel unique. Yeah, okay. And if we don't get that, that loving way of feeling unique, then it has to come through crazy things, right? And we paint our hair funny colors, and we do other silly things, and we do stupid things because we want we want people to recognize, oh, here he is, right? But is there a way for them to get that, that right? Now, there's a way to do that also internally. There's, there's a way to do it internally without needing other people to. That's the next level, right? There's a way to have a healthy, healthy attention, a healthy acknowledgement of the self, and not needing other people, that's a later, that's a later, a later stage. We want to get to that. Okay? So, it is rare that you find people who do their acts of kindness in a hidden fashion. Everything is exposed and open for everyone to compliment and praise the doer. True altruistic deeds would demand that we keep our actions out of sight from others. Had the Torah been given... Had the Torah... Sorry... Had the Torah not been given, where would we learn good traits from our sages say? Like modesty. Where would we learn modesty from? Right? If, if we did not have the Torah to teach us modesty, where would we learn it from? Our sages tell us we would learn it from a cat. Why? And we would learn not to steal from an ant. Why would we learn, why would we learn modesty from a cat? A cat when it needs to do its, its things, right? So what does it do? It finds a quiet corner, it digs a little hole, does what it needs to do, and then covers it up. Nobody needs to know. Nobody needs to see. You can think of a dog. Dogs don't do that. Dogs don't care where they are. They don't have that self-dignity. They don't have that modesty. But, but, uh, no, I love dogs. It's fine. I love dogs. Uh, but, but, but modesty is not, is not their strong suit. Modesty is not, not their strong suit. They have other qualities. They have heart. Right, they do have heart. And that's why it's they called do. a kelev, it's yeah. kolev. But a, a chatul, which is a cat, comes from the word chitul. Chitul is a diaper. A diaper keeps it hidden, keeps it modest, right? And that's the same thing. The act of a chatul is that it, it keeps its business modest. It keeps it hidden, keeps it out of the eye, right? It's, it's the responsibility of women, especially, right, not to draw attention to their bodies, uh, and specifically to be cautious not to be drawing men's eyes towards themselves, right? 
and it's 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 not an easy task, especially today where you have a world which is so outrageously uh, immodest, to say the least. It, it becomes almost who can who can be wearing less and who can be showing more and who can be right in, in such a it's such a a, a self uh, denigrating way. There's no respect. There's no internal world anymore. Everything is out. Everything. There's no more privacy. What happened to our own, our own dignity? Okay, and that's and that's something that we want to we want to uh, strengthen. Social media is right. The social media, right? What if you stood as the president? I mean, with the JFK, all the presidents before him, they wore hats. Okay, so there's another thing when we talk about modesty. We have to be very, very careful because modesty doesn't mean a certain set of rules. Modesty means what societal uh, acceptance is. Okay, so there are certain norms. If I were to walk around today with a bow tie and a hat like they did 100 years ago, you'd look at me like I'm a lunatic, right? That wouldn't be modesty either, right? So obviously things change with time. You, you understand? Then th those norms do change, but again, there's a limit to how much that changes, right? We still need to cover our bodies. We need to be dressed normally, right? Now, it could be that uh, President JFK realized that at that time already, it was something which was, wasn't becoming the norm anymore. I don't know, right? We're going to talk, actually, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about judging people favorably, and perhaps we'll be able to use that. We'll be able to judge them favorably, right? But the idea is not to call extra attention to ourselves. But not to stand out. What's that? Should we all dress the same? We don't need to dress the same. Again, well, you need to feel your uniqueness. Except you know, David, if I saw that you came with the same tie, I'd have to go home but right, but and change my time. Just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking, you know, Shabbat. Yeah. You go to some of these synagogues, they all dress the same. Black hats, black suit, white shirt. You don't dress like that, you stand out. Right, so that's, that's again, but again, that's, that's, it's like when you go to the opera, right? Everyone's, everyone's dressed, some people are dressed in their, in their tuxedos, some people are dressed in, right? It's, 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 it, now, if you came in your jeans and t-shirt, it would be a little, right, a little immodest right. for the place, right? Yeah. Now, there are people who want to stand out, so they'll come like that, right? Yes. Okay, so, but I, the idea is, Modesty means not calling that extra attention to yourself. And that's what we're trying to attain. Do you know tonight. what, Rabbi? The problem today is just what you were talking about with all the gross immodesty in the world is it's become the norm. It's become the norm to, to, to not be dressed. Which, which it's all awful. the more calls for us to start working on ourselves, yeah, to, 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 to bring back that, to restore that mm -hmm. dignity in the world. Yeah. Right? To restore mm -hmm. that, that self-respect. Okay. There's nothing so dear... Th What's that? Say that again about self-respect. I think that part... That, is that, that's yeah. A big part of modesty. Again, the only, the only reason people have the lack of modesty is because they don't have that self-value that self -value internally and that self-worth. The more a person feels good about themselves, the less they need someone else to acknowledge them, the less they need to stand out for other people's attention. Except when you just mentioned a moment ago about adhering to societal norms. See, the norm today, unfortunately, is, is basically to dress in an immodest way. I talk to my husband about this all the time. Modest. It drives me crazy. No, it so does. I, I dress modest. Now, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking with you only. I, I see I very few people dressed immodestly. Immodestly? Yeah, that, Right. You do, you ever, have, do you ever have watch television? I mean, all you have right. to do well, is go to the mall, you know, not just look around. It's right, so there's nothing, the, the Midrash, the Midrash says, the, the Midrash says the following, there is nothing so dear to Hashem as modesty. Okay, because modesty really identifies the person's internal quality and their internal relationship with God. The more we have outside, the, possibly it's a reflection of how little we have inside. It, right? The more we have inside, the less we need to show outside. Right? I'll tell you, that was part of my own personal growth, by the way, is when I came to, to Israel, I came right after ninth grade, I went for tenth grade, I went to Israel, 
and I started learning in the yeshiva, the first question I asked a group of Israeli students in the yeshiva I was learning in is which cleaners do they use? You know, when I was, I used to send my shirts to the cleaners, right? They used to have to, has to, have to you know, they had to take, everything had to be, right? I came and I asked them, like, you know, where, where does everyone, you know, where do they ching their shirts here? Like, where do they, where? And they look at me, it's like, what? What are you talking about? And these guys were immersed in Torah study, right? They didn't care about this stuff, right? And it was, it was to me, it was like the biggest shock. You know what? Why is this so important to me? Perhaps because I don't have enough Torah in my life. The more Torah I'll have in my life, the less I'll need my shirts to be so perfectly, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, ironed. So we see that modesty was also very critical and important in the temple. It was, right? What do we see in the temple? It said that the Beth HaMikdash, we see that God wanted there specifically to be a ramp, not a staircase. Why? So that the Kohen Gadol shouldn't have to raise up his legs and reveal uh, the parts of his body to the floor of the temple. Right? Not to the walls of the temple, to the floor of the temple. To keep an extra level of modesty. Right? So, again, it's, it's, it's a certain... Because the Kohen Gadol should be carrying himself like royalty. It should also be an internal royalty, an internal feeling of self-worth and self-value. You know that it says that a, a, a Torah scholar shouldn't run in the street shouldn't run, right? It shouldn't take a psiya gasa, it's called. It shouldn't run in the street. Why? Because it's undignified. It's undignified for, for someone who has, right, hopefully, a, 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 a lot of Torah content to be running like a, like a hooligan, right? So you, don't, you don't need to run, okay? One must be modest in private too. Right? The halacha tells us, and we're going to learn this in a few weeks, hopefully, when we learn uh, the halacha, one minute, one halacha, one minute, one halacha every day, we're going to learn about how to sleep. And the Torah, the, the, Torah, the halacha gives us a guideline of how to sleep. Also, the way in which we sleep, the way we lay, there's a way to do that modestly as well. Okay? I'll, we'll see about it soon. Don't throw stones at me. Don't throw stones at me. Yes? Is it okay women and men to enhance themselves with maybe facelifts or breast enhancements or toupees. Would that be against modesty or if you want to make yourself feel better? Again, again, that's, a, that's, a, that's probably something if someone were to ask me a case-by-case -case situation, you have to know who the person is and the person has to know what's really going on inside. Why do they really need it? Right, mm -hmm. right. Okay, so if if a person, Some do it to feel better, right? oh, okay. But again, we, we see that there's a, the idea here is that there's something inside that needs to be adjusted, right, through the outside being changed. Right, right. and it's not going to help. Do you think they're going to feel better about themselves? It's not going to help. It'll be much better for them to get some attention, healthy attention from their parents and from those that that love them, yeah. and from themselves. To work on themselves, that will enhance them a lot more than the external uh, treatments. So that would be against modesty. I don't. I don't think. Again, it's it's a case. Modesty. You see, it's very hard. The rabbis don't put a, a lot of emphasis on the details of modesty. They put emphasis now. Modern day rabbis do. My sister went to school in Israel, and for some ridiculous reason, they had a fourteen page manual on the dress code. That is ridiculous. That's, that's modern-day rabbis trying to find a way to keep themselves busy. That's not, that's not what the Torah is about. That's not... That's not no, I'm serious. It's craziness. You have to have 14, pa 14 pages on dress code. What about for the men? Leave them alone. <laughs> Nobody cares about the men. Right? right? And they have dress code monitors. It's craziness what's going on. The idea is if we made our children feel good about themselves, they wouldn't need this. Right? right? Okay. One should dress modestly, not too loud, and calling humility uh, eventually will sink in. Rachel was modest. Shaul was modest. Saul was modest. He didn't reveal that he had become king. He didn't want to tell everyone that he became king. He was modest. He didn't need, right? I don't need to announce to everyone that I'm, that I'm the king. Staying within our space without invading the space of others is part of modesty, right? 
Modesty is I'm, I'm comfortable with who I am. I'm comfortable in my own space. I don't need to take everybody else's space and steal their space in order for me to go, feel good about myself. Now, like we mentioned when we spoke about humility, modesty and humility go a little bit together. They have a lot of the same roots, right? It says that Esther wore the royal garbs, right? Our sages tell us, what was that? The clothes of her ancestors. Just like her ancestors were modest, so too she was modest. That's what it means. When it says the royal garbs in the Megillah, it's referring to the modesty. She carried herself with incredible modesty. And it says that the whole reason that she was chosen by Ahasuerus was also because of her modesty. People think, oh, more show, right? The more attention, the more attractive. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite, right? Her essence was royalty. Modesty is royalty, okay? And like you mentioned just before, it applies to men just like it applies to women. Mankind is different from animals, because we carry ourselves with modesty. Animals don't know the difference of modesty, except for the cat. All animals, they have no concept of modesty. They have no, no such concept, right? Well, they are naturally modest, are they not? They are, yes. Well, animals, not necessarily, not all animals are. No? Just cats. Leave it to cats, that's enough, right? Okay, right. Even in a closed room, God's glory fills everywhere, right? So it doesn't make a difference if we're home alone. It doesn't mean that we should... We should carry ourselves in an unmodest, in, immodest way, right? We have the laws of modesty in a washroom, right? A person goes to the bathroom, there's a way that they, they're supposed to carry themselves there as well. What, there's nobody else here, there's nobody who sees, right? But there's a self-worth, there's a self-dignity, just between me and myself, right? Every person, the way they carry themselves, that also has to be with modesty. Modesty of speech and actions, not to talk or discuss intimate issues for no reason, right? People... You go, people have uh, what they call locker room banter, right? Or they have, uh, or they have bar talk, right? It's, there's no reason for people to discuss intimate issues for no, for no necessary reason, okay? It says, it says in Proverbs 11.2, The modest will achieve wisdom. Someone who's modest can achieve wisdom. Why? Because if you're constantly pushing out your impression to the world, you don't have the time to take in, right? When you're modest inside, you're comfortable with who you are, then you can take things in, okay? The way we started off tonight with Micah, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, right? right? You want to be God-like? Right. Carry yourself with modesty. God carries himself with modesty. That's the way of God to be with modesty. So that is a mitzvah, uh, conducting oneself in a modest manner, is a mitzvah? Well, walking in the ways of God is, also, is, is that. Just like God is modest, we're modest. So that's all part of the traits of being walking in the ways of God. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Now, what is, what is, uh, what is uh, the, the Gaon of Vilna says... It is the way of the righteous to hide their ways so that people don't see. So it's private. Not everyone needs to know my business. Not everyone needs to know all the good deeds that I do. Not everyone, you don't have to announce it on a speaker for make sure everybody hears. Oh, just don't forget, I am the one who sponsored this. People, not everyone needs to know everything, right? Now there's something very, very, very important. Empty people make a lot of noise. Okay? The emptier a jar is, and take a jar that has only one coin in it, and shake it up, right? Makes a ton of noise. Take a jar that is three quarters filled with coins, right? And shake it. It hardly makes any noise. Why? The more full you are inside, the less noise you need to make. Right? The, the less content we have, the more noise we make. Right? And that's a very important thing. Is to, maybe if I have such a need to make all that noise, maybe there's only just one coin in there. We're shaking it around. Right? Thinking, hey, look at me, look at me. But it's because it's empty. Right? That's what the, 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 our sages say. Istera belegina kish kish karya. The emptier something is, the more noise it makes. Okay? <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, so there was anybody here familiar with the Dibuk? A Dibuk. A Dibuk is like a, 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 a spirit, a demon, right, that, it, that gets caught onto a person. And they once, they once asked a Dibuk about the Gra, of the Vilna Gong. And they asked him, so of the 39 righteous people in our generation, where, was, where is the Vilna Gong holding? So they said, he's the third of the 36. They said, why isn't he the first? He said, because, not his fault, he's so famous and so well known, it takes away from his, from his status. Right? Not at his fault, not at his doing. But that, that's, that's a story that's told, and if, it's, if it's anything is here is inaccurate, I beg forgiveness from the Gaon of Vilna. But Tsanua, what does Tsanua mean? Someone who's modest means one who keeps his deeds secret and out of the public eye. All right? Okay, so we see asot mishpat v'avat chesed. To do judgment and to love kindness. It says like this, judgment is in public, it's in court. Right? But kindness is, uh, kindness, uh, is revealed. Abraham's kindness was known to all, right? Because, we, why was it known to all? Because it says, one of the things we, we learned about when you do an act of kindness to someone, you have to inform them. Why do you have to inform them? So that it brings about more love in the world. The more love there is, right, the more someone knows that I went out of my way to do a, a kind act for them, right? Now that they know of my kind act, it will bring about love. But that's the only reason, so that people love each other but not to reveal it to strangers. It means we don't go and put on, on a speakerphone, everyone should know, uh, I just did an act of kindness, I, I delivered fruit to someone who was, I, I brought chicken soup to someone who was sick. Right? The person you actually help out, them specifically you tell. So that it add, brings love, in the more, there should be more love in the world. But we don't announce it to the general public. Right? Um, we're running out of time here. So I want to. Uh, oh, so just just two more things here. To Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg used to say that modesty is not about co- being covered up, but rather about the awareness of a private life and of a of a personal dignity. Today, this almost doesn't exist. Therefore, everything is flaunted and everything is public. Okay, people don't have that internal world. Being a listener is not talking always. Allow yourself to accept from others. You have two eyes, two ears, one mouth. Right? So we should listen twice of what we speak. Right? Listen double the amount of what you talk. Right? Talk, 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 talk. Time to do more more listening than, 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 uh, than uh, talking. It says about the Bach, the Bach once sent someone to investigate Shaktai Tzvi. Shaktai Tzvi, there were rumors about him that he was possibly the Mashiach. He wanted to know, is it real? Maybe, maybe he really is the Mashiach. See, he sent someone, I believe it was his son-in-law, to go investigate whether or not Shaktai Tzvi was the, the, uh, the Mashiach. And when he returned, he said he isn't Mashiach. He's for sure not Mashiach. He said, how do you know? How do you know he's not the Mashiach? He said, because when I saw him, he was sitting in a way that was immodest. And Mashiach doesn't carry himself in a way that's immodest. Right? So it cannot be him. One conclusive. Absolutely not him. So, we're going to stop here. Oh, and we mentioned earlier that the, the Aron, the, the Ark, didn't take any space. And that represented peace. We have to let other people have their space. Right? The more we have an internal world, the less we need an external word, world. So let's take out our meter worksheets now, and if we can just jot down what we feel are the, are the uh, what is the definition of the trait of modesty, and where we're holding in it, take an introspection, uh, calculate for yourself uh, whether or not you feel you're a, a one and you're weak in this trait, or you're a ten and perfect. You're f- perfectly comfortable with yourself, you don't need to show the world anything, or maybe just a little bit I want people to know here and there. And then, what do you plan to accomplish with the work in this trait? 
What tools do you currently possess that can be immediately employed to help affect a small measure of change in this trait? And then what are you going to do this coming week? What are you going to do this coming week uh, to work on this trait? All right? So I accepted myself to work on this midah of tzniyut, of modesty, in the following way. Maybe three times a day or four times a day, I will start building myself up internally. Maybe I'll be able to say some positive things to myself. You know something? You really are great. You really are good. You re- find something that you can do for yourself to encourage yourself and build yourself up internally so you don't need to come on to being showy and, uh, and, and uh, flamboyant to the rest of the world and showing off all of your greatness. With that, my friends on Facebook, thank you for joining us. If you liked it, please like it. If you did not like it, share it so that other people per- perhaps will like it. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome to join us here every Monday night at 7.30 at the Torch Center where we are on a journey of hopefully attaining character perfection through working hard every week to try to become the best people we can be. Thank you for joining us, and we're going to continue with the class here live. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal.